greetings. Welcome to the Province One Cultural Diversity and Anti-Racism Task Force series of web conferences. Our goal is to explore diversity and to nurture cultural competence. I am the Reverend Karen B. Montagna, one of the coordinators of the task force. My partner tonight is Mr. James McKim, Province One Rep to the Executive Council Anti-Racism Task Force, Chair of the New Hampshire Diversity Committee, and another leader in this task force. As you know, our speaker tonight is the Honorable Byron Rushing, Vice President of the Episcopal um, General Convention House of Deputies and Assistant Majority Leader of the Massachusetts House of Representatives. And he will share with us how his varying roles in the church and government offer a unique perspective on the current state of race and racism in the United States. So let us begin with prayer. God be with you. And also with you. Dear God, we give you thanks for the gift of life, for the struggle and mystery and the gift of prophecy that leads us through our dim vision, our sluggish and um, hurting hearts. We ask that you convict us, that we cannot but answer your call of love to safe keep the dignity of all people. We ask that you give us tools that we can ignore, we cannot ignore, and give us leaders with strength of heart that will lead us forward in your work of love. All this we ask in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. So um, as we begin this evening, I want to just pause and ask, um, one of our friends is hiding in the background that's um, helping us with this. Is there anything that I have forgotten that I need to add before we get started? No. Okay. So, um, Byron, um, our first question is, from where you sit, where are we with race relations today relative to 25 years ago, to 50 years ago, to 100 years ago? Um, and, you know, if it helps to think about what has worked and what has not worked. At, I want to first uh, uh, thank you for inviting me to be with you uh, this evening. This is uh, fun, but I, I do want everybody to understand that I don't, I, I don't use this medium very often. And if, 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 uh, if my computer falls over, uh, be patient with me. And <laughs> so it really is good to be here and to be, be with friends. Um, let me start off by saying that it's a great question because I don't know if we can organize around ending racism just like we could not, like we cannot organize to end uh, any of the isms um, without a true, a honest sense of history. So asking a historical question at the beginning is just so, so appropriate. Um, I have to remind uh, uh, especially religious people um, and Christians uh, many times that uh, history and memory is a key part of our belief and theology, that um, we, um, uh, those of you who have gone to divinity school, who have gone to theology school, know the fancy word uh, for memory. Um, and it's actually a word that I think we should get all Episcoparians to learn and we should stick it in the catechism of the new prayer book that we're working, we're going to figure out a way to have in 10 or 15 more years, right? And that word, of course, is anamnesis, anamnesis. And it is the, the most important thing to remember. And, of course, it, for Jews, it is that whole story of Passover, is part of their anamnesis. And for us, we hear that story every Sunday if we go to church. 
Um, and that story is told over and over again, and that story even includes the word remember. And so memory and history is key um, to us understanding God and therefore understanding ourselves. And if we're going to approach anything uh, that is going to mean that we're going to have to really struggle with it, really work at it, uh, it is certainly an appropriate place to start. I want to do a little introduction to 100 years ago or 150 years ago because I do think we need, for race, we need to start at the beginning. And the beginning for race, I think, for us in the Americas, not just here in the United States, but all of the Americas, the beginning for us, of course, is the, is the meeting of three peoples. It is the story of Europeans coming to the Americas. There was no America before there was Europeans. There were people living here, but they did not live in America. Right? America is not an indigenous word. And that it is the meeting of those Europeans with the indigenous people here, and almost immediately a decision by the Europeans who came here that they did not have sufficient labor to do the exploitation that they wanted to do. And in order to do that, they needed more people than were even here. And they certainly needed more people than Europeans. And it was that decision to... After, to, as they engaged in taking over, taking, literally taking the land that was here, to decide then to take labor from Africa and bring it here, uh, that brings us, that is the origin of where we are right now. If we have an origin story, that origin story is European conquest, their amazement at the resources that were here. Remember, the first one didn't know where he was. Right? And then the, what that taking that land meant to the indigenous people and the importation right, of Africans to supplement their, their labor here in huge numbers. And that is our origin story. And that origin story is one that we have abbreviated and given colors to. It is the story of white people, red people, and black people. And we have to start there. And then to understand, to come closer to the understanding of the relationship between white people and black people in this country, it is that we cannot do that without talking about slavery. And I try to remind people about slavery, that slavery is uh, horrible, was horrible, uh, but was also very complicated. It was not something that was simple. It was as complicated as it was the whole history of white people dealing with themselves was complicated, and of course, the history of white people and indigenous people was complicated. And every time we simplify that history, um, we g prevent ourselves from coming to any conclusion of what we should do in the future that is based on what we've done in the past. And I will end the piece about slavery just reminding people about the numbers. And that if, if you, you, just for, for, North, for what is now the, the eastern part of the United States, what we, what we, what we, but of course what we call the United, what, of all the United States, we usually use the figure of 1619, of when the first Africans came to what is now the United States, when slaves were, when Africans were brought to Virginia. And the, right about, about t almost 10 years, after uh, Virginia got a name, Virginia, by Europeans who had settled there in Jamestown. And if you use that 
as the beginning of slavery, then slavery officially ends for all Africans in what is now the United States in 1865 with the passage of the 13th Amendment. If you take that number of years, it's 246, and add 246 to 1865, it will not be until 2111 that black people as a people will have been free in America as long as they have been enslaved in America. It's a big thing we're talking about when we're talking about the history of the institution that brought us to the point we are. Let's go back now. That's the introduction. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> so go back to your question. I, I would go back. I think really the point that when, when we talk about stuff different stuff happening. Of course, there were, wonderful, there were wonderful attempts at liberation and, uh, and abolition um, before the Civil War, but for the majority, the great majority of Africans, the event that ended slavery, that freed black people, was the Civil War. The Civil War. And we need to think about that a lot. Um, about how that how ingrained this institution was that it took such a uh, really ferocious uh, event uh, to end it, and um, and we Episcopalians, as a, and a, a small aside, um, need to talk about the Civil War a lot more than we do. We live. We have invented a myth about the Civil War and the Episcopal Church that goes along with all the myths that got created after the Civil War in the United States um, okay. about what the Civil War was all about. I'm and gonna, so, can I ask you, I'm interrupting, can I ask you as you're forming your thoughts about that to think about how what you're going to say um, moves us into the um, next question, which is what are the challenges? I think actually that you're moving in that direction because of the foundation of the Civil War and our myth, then we have certain challenges. I think that's absolutely right. And one of the things that we decided to do after the Civil War as a country um, was as we, we could not move ourselves away from the huge institutional racism that existed at the time. And so even, the peop even many of the people who were in favor of ending slavery and if you probably asked the, at the near the end of the war what the average Union soldier, what the war was about, that Union soldier, because of where Lincoln had come, um, would probably have said to end slavery and preserve the Union. He would probably have said both. And the, uh, but after the war, the, the decisions for a number of reasons were made that if the country was going to stay together, it had to figure out a way to get the white people to stay together. And in order to stay, have the white people stay together, they, would, they essentially agreed to maintain a two-class system in the country so that black people would not be allowed to express their new gained legal freedom as uh, civil rights for in, as they progressed in the country. Um, and uh, the, the myth, of course, we have about the Civil War and the Episcopal Church is that everybody just waited um, for the war to be over and they never really split. Um, and uh, if anybody who believes, believes that has never read what the Southern Church did. The Southern Church split. The Southern Church organized the Episcopal Church of the Confederacy. They had their own prayer book. They had their own canons. They elected at least one bishop. Right? They thought they were going to win. And they had a church that said, that said in its public documents that one of the things they, that they believed in that they believed was biblical was slavery. So we, for a variety of reasons, let them back in after the, after, without, without a big to-do, 
let them back into the Episcopal Church um, after the Civil War. But we did it the same way the secular unity was happening. We did it by abandoning black people. And so South Carolina, which at least half of the members of the Episcopal Church in South Carolina were African American, most of them enslaved, after the Civil War were thrown, if they had buses, would have been thrown under the bus. They were thrown under the carriage. And they, of course, had, were, were given, were, there was no welcome for them in the Episcopal Church in South Carolina after the Civil War. And most of them, of course, became African Methodists, either AMEs or AMEZs. So what do you think is the legacy of that history for us today that we're struggling with? Part of that, I think, is that we um, are struggling with trying to figure out uh, uh, how we can be a church for all races without blaming any of the races that we want to welcome into the church. And we blame them. Um, and we haven't really finished blaming them. Right? So anytime you hear a phrase that, that the reason why we have so few black people in, in the Episcopal Church is because of our liturgy, or some other nonsense. Um, no, that's, that, that, that is part of that, that blame that we have to overcome. Now, we had a fascinating experiment at the, at, at, right after the Civil War, that when it became clear that the powers in the South were not going to support any civil rights for the newly emancipated slaves, the Republicans, in uh, uh, in in uh, the the major the then majority Republicans in the United States government decided to in, to protect and insist on those civil rights and to do that with, by protecting the black people in the South and they did that by maintaining the troops Union troops in the South so that black people could could then uh, act out act on this newly guaranteed civil rights, and that's the whole period of Reconstruction, um, when you have uh, black people being able to, be, to, have be, to participate in elections, and black people able to be elected to various offices, and black people able to participate in all the institutions uh, that, the, that, the South was that the South was putting together after the war. That, of course, the end of that was the success of the idea of a unified white population in the United States. And that ended Reconstruction uh, with the Grand Compromise. Um, and, the, <clears throat> and, and after that, uh, black people in the South uh, were abandoned by any of the white forces in the North. That gets us into the period of Jim Crow. And in the period of Jim Crow, <clears throat> we had, um, we essentially uh, left uh, black people to figure out how to do it all by themselves, um, wherever they were. They had to figure out how to do it by themselves. And the major decision that black people are able to, to make and to carry out is at the end of the 19th century when they decide to abandon the South. They attempted to leave. They, they, that the only way that they could, could gain safety from the ongoing violence uh, carried out against their communities in the South was to get away from the South. And so they moved North. Um, and you have the Great Migration. And in that Great Migration, um, black people uh, uh, you, uh, the sh you have a shift in the black population that is able to have civil rights, that is able to have some small degree of uh, political, gain some small degree of political power. And you start to see um, the beginning of not only economic development inside the black community, but you begin to see political uh, development inside the black community that allows them to, be, to begin to build the institutions that will allow them to move for the success of 
all black people in the civil rights of this country. So I'm going to. And then we were. And that's when we. And that's when you and I were born. When that was happening. <laughs> and so I'm going to ask you now. Um, just thinking about the time that we want to leave for folks to ask questions. I mean, I think this is a great segue because, you know, as we were talking about earlier, many of our churches are reading the new Jim Crow. But I want to ask you um, about um, General Convention and the resolutions that happened there. And um, a particular question that I want to ask is based on what you've seen, given the history that you've outlined for us, given this moment of um, that you we've kind of taken a pause, the, new, the old Jim Crow, um, Michelle Alexander declares that we're in a new Jim Crow. She, um, she frames it around the um, prison institution of prisons. Um, but I want to ask, along with that in terms of political power, um, we have church power. And as you think about um, your work in the province and in the church, you know, we're looking to see where can all this um, challenge us to move next? What do, we, what do we have to confront next as we move into um, the second, I think we're well beyond the second era of the new Jim Crow, but as we move into another era? I think it's important as Episcopalians that we remember um, that uh, after World War II, um, Although the questions about race, had, there, were lists, there were a few uh, discussions about them in the Episcopal Church. The Episcopal Church, the established Episcopal Church, uh, agreed with the status quo. Um, and so they, uh, they, they, they knew they had black people. Um, they, uh, were, they, were, they were happy to help those black people as long as those black people stayed in their black churches. Um, and if they didn't want to stay in their black churches, they created some black churches for them. And the, uh, but, but the 1954 decision of the Supreme Court had as big effect on the Episcopal Church as it had on the whole population of white people uh, in the United States. And so those white people, white Episcopalians, who had been concerned about this were invigorated, and they started to raise these questions again, the black Episcopalians who were still there, raised these, all of these questions all over again, and we, and we had this torturous uh, uh, history of integrating the Episcopal Church, integrating our institutions, uh, things like the University of the South, Swanee, um, uh, where, where, half the staff, where half the half the staff quit over, because the board wouldn't integrate the school. Um, and we're talking about relatively new, this is the 1950s. And, and uh, I'll end with just recommending that everybody, if they haven't already, read Episcoparians and Race, which is the history of, of that. And then, and, and so we, we pushed ourselves um, and into uh, the 1960s and 1970s, um, but it took a long time uh, to make these decisions. Uh, and while we were doing that, there were other issues coming before us, sexism and heterosexism that we had to deal with, and we dealt with those issues, as a but always informed by this history that we had with black people. And so we come into the 1990s, and the Episcopal Church is ready to have a serious conversation about race. And that's when we pass, and that's, of course, we pass our first resolution at the end of the 1990s that actually talks about racism. And that's the resolution that said that we wanted to become a church of and for all races without racism, committed to end racism in the world. And it is a wonderful, succinct statement that I think is relevant to this moment. Um, and we did that by training. We said, let us engage as many people as possible in anti-racism training. I think that what we came to this, what has happened over these years, is that has been relatively successful, but people in all of, those, in, in all of these discussions in that training have realized one piece, and that is 
What next? What do we do with it? What do we do with it? And I think we came into this last convention in Salt Lake City trying to answer that question. How do we get beyond training? How do we be, get beyond uh, a acknowledgement that we're racist? And how do we dismantle racism in this institution, our Episcopal Church, and in this world? And how do we be participants in that, um, which is quite remarkable. And so we came to, and so we said that's what we would, that's what, that's what we would ask. And, it, and of course, we were so optimistic about who was going to lead us um, as, as a presiding bishop in this church. We said, why not? If not now, don't make, there's no way, there's no reason uh, to, to uh, put off making this demand. And so, and, and so, so that is the demand uh, that, is, that, that has been made, that the church understands and affirms that the, call to pray, that the call to pray and act for reconciliation is integral to our witness of the gospel in Jesus Christ and our living into the demands of our baptismal covenant. I mean, that's quite remarkable. I mean, so what we're saying is you, not, you cannot be an Episcopalian if you don't participate in the history of racism and in and knowing about and, and, and the knowledge of the history of racism and seeing ending racism as a key part of our baptismal call to reconciliation of all people to, to themselves and to God. So Byron, that's great. And at this point, I'm going to turn it over to my partner, James, um, and have James, because um, I think that that gives us a great framework, um, you know, an open-ended framework on the, the growing and living into side, the challenge, I think, that you've actually um, offered us. And I'm going to let James um, field some of the questions that are coming up. Sure. Thank you, Karen. And, and uh, thank you, Byron, for, for that great history lesson for a number of us and reminding us uh, of what has happened. And um, I, what's especially poignant for me is I actually grew up in Charleston, South Carolina. And uh, my mother was an AME, my father was Baptist, and I was raised actually in the Episcopal Church. <laughs> so uh, a lot of that history I, I've somewhat lived through. Um, and it, it, Have you ever gone back to see if you had any any previous people who were Episcopalians who became the Amy's? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I haven't quite done that yet, but that's probably on one of my next trips. I will I will do that. Um, but I, I think you so well outlined the major challenge ahead of us in going beyond training, and that's not to say that we stop training, but what's next after training? What what's what are the, the what's what do we do with that training? And I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on from a province one perspective, uh, what we uh, can and should be doing, and then how does that feed into what the Greater Episcopal Church uh, is trying to do and what we can do along those lines in that broader arena. I think in province one, um, and, and I, I think we should. I think we should change our name to New England. <laughs> and so, but in New England, um, we have, uh, uh, of course, uh, when you if we if we did that history and said what happened in New England where all this stuff was happening, um, we have a history, of course, that's very mixed. Of course, we we can we can find. Uh, uh, many people in New England who are part of the the criticism of the way the United States was being formed and trying to find a way that that everyone could, that everyone could have citizenship in the United States. Now it wasn't the majority of people in New England, but it probably, but it was a big chunk. There was a it was a big minority of people in New England, so big enough so that they were influential. So I think we, we need to, to see ourselves that way because we do not, we, and we need to see ourselves as a place that is, that is overwhelmingly majority white with significant black and brown populations 
um, and even uh, in small uh, uh, populations of indigenous people that should that have the opportunity to be engaged in this discussion. And so what you are doing is probably the first thing I would recommend to anybody, and that is let's start having the discussion. In order to have the discussion, as you know, um, it's very hard to have the discussion with all the people in the same room at the, without any preparation for that everybody being in the same room because we just don't know how to do it. And so we have to have that, we have, with, that, with that preparation, let's, let's get into those rooms as soon as possible. But the other thing that I think is really important, of course, is to try to figure out what are the examples of the disparities that exist in New England because of racism. What are the, what are, when we look at the, when you look at the number of people who are in prison in Vermont, most, 99% of those people might be white, right? My guess is, though, the other 1%, we know who they are, right? And, and then, of course, in Massachusetts, you know, we don't have the huge number of people in prison that other states have, but when we look at that percentage, the percentage of black and brown people are far higher than the percentage of brown people in the general population of the state. We should be looking at all of those aspects of how racism has, has, is present in very real, concrete ways where it is hurting people who, are, who we know. We don't, might not, we might not, they might not be our friends, but we can, we can, we can go, we can, tra we don't have to travel far to find them. So in the whole, uh, just, uh, just, uh, re re remarkable, um, uh, problem with, with, uh, with, with the mortgage crisis, uh, in all, with, in the, with, with all of the foreclosures of homes that poor and working class people had purchased, right? And when we look, when we examine that, it becomes clear that that is another ex example of racist, institutional racism. Uh, and that is, that went on in New England as well as it went on all over the country. And then what can we do about that? What, 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 are the, what are the ways we can prevent that from ever happening, but also are there ways that there can be some uh, response where people can begin to think that they can become whole um, from all of the loss that, that occurred at that time. It is estimated that this was the largest loss of wealth by people of color in this country ever. Uh, was 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 created in in the mortgage crisis, and we're talking about um, a country where the difference between the wealth of people of color and the wealth of white people is in the magnitude of twenty five to thirty percent, right? Difference, right? Um, uh, not thirty five, not thirty five hundred percent. Multiply it by thirty five, and so. This, the, I think the, these are the areas that we need to be approaching. That probably for many of us, we have the opportunity to do this without traveling very far. So all of us, in the, in most of us who live in cities in New England can do this without traveling very far. So there are lots of people in New England um, who do not see people of color every day. Right? So... The, and there we have to talk about what are the ways that as a, as a citizen of the state of Maine or citizen of the state of Vermont and New Hampshire, what are the ways that you are benefiting from racism and what are the ways that you can engage in the public policy necessary in your state and to get your state to, co to, to engage in the public policy of this country that will get the country to make this shift uh, so, that we can, that, so that we can get closer uh, to this goal. Does that make sense? It, it certainly makes sense to me and, and some of the work that we're doing on the task force and, and I'm doing here in New Hampshire are 
really focusing on that, that issue of white privilege and helping people to understand how they're benefiting from the institutional white privilege that has uh, occurred over the years and through the history that, 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 you, uh, that you described. Um, so I, I think understanding awareness is the, the, first, <laughs> the first thing we have to have. And, and uh, I think for people of color, as you said, um, we have uh, almost an obligation to go and preach about the fact that there is, we have to, we can bring that presence that there is racism today. It's not something that because New England doesn't have a lot of black people doesn't exist. It exists today. And the institutions that uh, have been established uh, benefit everyone who's not of color. Um, so I, I'd love to also get your, your thoughts on um, in terms of um, going beyond raising awareness, though, um, we, we talk about social justice. We talk about um, talking policy. We talk about getting involved as, as a citizen. How do we do that from the perspective of Jesus' teachings? What, 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 how do you share um, that drive to improve everyone's lot without marginalizing people by talking about racism. Well, I think that, see, I think that we should talk about racism um, in the historic uh, term that when you don't treat people the same way from the beginning, how horrible that can turn out, right? How easily it can become in institutionalized. And so part of the whole idea of privilege is to understand all the ways that in your life right now, there are people that don't have the privilege that you have. And it's not always a privilege of race. And we, should, we have to spend a lot of time, I think, just concentrating on difference and the fact, and, and as, a, as parishes, then to really think about of the people who are around my building, who don't I really want in here? Who would be a problem? Who would be a problem if they came in here? Why is that? And why would they be a problem? What is it that makes people different right in my community when, and when it has nothing to do with race? In a sense, we represent the obvious different people. Right? But the problem for Christians is that no one should be different. We, see, we see, can celebrate diversity if no one is different. And so if everyone is welcome, and that's why sometimes I think that maybe we should go back and have uh, certainly uh, and have our parishes draw boundaries, geographic boundaries. And then everybody that's in that boundary is in your parish, whether they come or not, whether they are of the same religion, economic group, or what, that you, that instead of saying welcome on our door, we put welcome on our T-shirt and go out to everybody in that geography and say, when we hear something bad happened to you, we, we are coming by to to see, is there anything that you can tell us? Is there anything we can do? And I think that going out is something that I'm hearing at least, um, that the, the, the national church is starting to encourage. Going out, not just being, the, the church is not just the building where we are, uh, worshiping, wor worshiping every Sunday. The church is out there. And we, we need to be out there um, being the church, not sitting in the church. I think, I think you're absolutely right. There are two out there for Christians, I think. There is the, there is the out there of, of saying that, if, that we feel that we have a special relationship to 
everyone that God loves. Right? That we, and because God loves us, and God loves them, and God loves them as much as he loves us, which is something I think, you know, we have to wake up sometimes and say in the morning and say that, because you certainly get through the day, and it's hard to believe that, <laughs> that a lot of people we run into are as loved as much as we are, right? Why aren't they showing it, you know? And, but, and the other thing I think that, we, that is really important is to understand that we're supposed to be serving Jesus following Jesus all the time, that we don't look for Jesus just on Sunday, right? And that means that we are, that we have to and uh, see our life and work and leisure um, all as ministry and, and, and mission. And so, and, and we should be able, uh, and it's hard. I, I try it, and it's not easy you know, to end the day saying, uh, what did I do today? When did, where, where did I see Jesus today, right? And if I didn't see Jesus today, it's probably not because Jesus wasn't there, right? <laughs> and, so, and where did I see Jesus today? And then what did I do? What did I do in my job? What did I do as a state representative that somehow, that somehow is part of, of my understanding of being a Christian. Well, you know, it, it does take you back to our baptismal covenant. We, we promise every day of our, of our lives. Um, we, we go through those verses in the, in the baptismal covenant, and we're reminded of them every time there's a baptism, um, that we are really supposed to serve. We are there to, to, to support um, the needs of every human being. And with, uh, with uh, the additions from the General Convention, now really the environment as well is, is part of that. Um, so if you, it, just if you would say a little bit more about the, the, um, the resolution at General Convention and, and what that means to you and what you think that means to us. One of the uh, aspect, one of the interesting uh, uh, aspects of this resolution um, was to uh, make sure uh, that if this is uh, a a uh, understanding of what all Episcopalians should be doing, then the leadership of the of the programs that come out of this, of the work that comes out of it, should be uh, overseen by the leadership of the church. So it's not so that the, that that the that the programs that come out of this should not be, should, should they they shouldn't be um, you know, uh, uh, although there'll be many committees and various informal and informal groups working on this um, that no none of these committees should be in charge of this it should be the leadership of the church so they said um, that the presiding bishop uh, the vice president of the house of bishops. Uh, the uh, president of the House of Deputies, the vice president of the House of Deputies, would be charged, and the words they use are to lead, direct, and be present to assure and account for the church's work of racial justice and reconciliation. And I think that was a uh, that that was just very important. That uh, when if you don't think. Uh, we're doing this uh, work. Um, that this that this that this work hasn't moved to a, 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 a to to engage more people and to engage more ideas uh, and 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 more theology. Uh, if you don't you don't have to, you you're not expected to complain to some committee. You can call up the presiding bishop and say, you know, you're in charge of this. What's going on? You can call me up as the vice president of the House of Deputies and say, what's going on? Now, we have already um, uh, had a, 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 a brief meeting um, about how to get, get going uh, with, with this next uh, uh, level of work. And one of the things that we want to do very soon is to draw together the people in the Episcopal Church who have already begun to do pieces of that work beyond anti-racism training. 
And our hope is to be able to have a day or two when we bring them together and listen to what they have been doing and talk about the various things that they are doing that we can urge uh, other Episcoparians to do. And again, to and encourage other Episcoparians who are doing this kind of work uh, to make that, to, to continue, to make that work available to other Episcoparians and to talk about the problems that uh, they are having that need that 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 together we would be able to, uh, to solve and overcome. Um, so, and I I think that we and I you know can look all over um, the Episcopal Church. We can look to the Diocese of New York and all the work that they're doing on reparations. We can look at the Diocese of Atlanta and the work that they are doing on racial uh, reconciliation and, 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 and their, their attempts to create the beloved community um, there in, in, in Atlanta. And then, of course, I hope that we'll be able to look at, at, the, at the New England province that I've just renamed you um, and the work that we're doing here and find ways of helping you but also finding ways of, of, of getting your work communicated to others in the church. I was um, uh, very um, touched by the story of the uh, parish in it's a Kansas that uh, has had, no, had only one black member. Have you, see, have you seen that story? Yeah, sure. I, hmm? And it got some coverage in the Episcopal News Service. And they uh, and 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 the and that member died in in the 1950s, and had been just briefly mentioned in a history of the parish, and this generation at the parish decided to find out who she was, and they did that. They find out who she was, and they find out two remarkable things about her. One was that she was always discriminated against when she came to the church because no one wanted to take communion from her in the from share the chalice with her, and they actually used, had another chalice that they used for her when they gave communion when she was there. And the other thing was that she, when, and she died and, uh, and was buried in a pauper's field. And they go out and, and decide that their expression of reconciliation will not be in general that their expression of repentance for uh, racist acts will, again, not be in general. They will be specific to what that congregation did with and to that woman. And, uh, and, so, and they have a service where they, they found the chalice. They have a service where they uh, use that chalice to give communion to everyone, and they raise money and put a marker on that woman's grave, and they write her history. They write her biography. It's quite remarkable. I wonder how many Episcopal churches have had a member, some part in their past history, one or two or three or four black members, or one or two or three or four Native American members like that, that were tolerated right, in their myths. Um, and if all of those churches that have that history could use that as the focus of their repentance of the sin of racism. So I think we need to look at things like that, what is happening on the ground right now that makes sense, and encourage people to find new ways of approaching this and of communicating the ways that are ongoing about approaching the whole question of reconciliation to we come, that we do our part toward that day when we all see ourselves fully as children of God. I think that's such a powerful story, and it, it speaks to me about um, about rectifying the sins of the past and also looking toward the future and making sure that what happened in the past doesn't happen again in the future. Uh, so right. looking looking both ways. And I, I see we're at, at 8.20. Um, I want to make sure that we um, encourage, invite folks on the phone to 
come off mute maybe and ask a question verbally or to type in your questions to chat. We've had a, a wide ranging um, discussion here today uh, from, from history lessons to um, psychology lessons to uh, neuroscience lessons, recognizing that we're all biased no matter what anybody thinks because that's just the way we're built as, as human beings, uh, to talking about how we can act within the province and how we can act outside the province. Um, so please type in your questions, your thoughts um, for the next few minutes we have here. And we have, let's see, Kevin says uh, that he was one of young adult pilgrims who went to Ferguson, Missouri. And as he left the parish, uh, sent, sent them with prayers, sent him with prayers that were given from fear, fear that has been ingrained because of the media's fear propaganda that's used against people of color, uh, yet fear was never on his heart as he continues to, to work within the cathedral concerning racial justice and reconciliation. How do I dismantle the fear myths, the fear of the other, of how, or how do I help to challenge it? So really question about addressing that fear um, of dealing with reconciliation and, and all the myths that go around with uh, the fear of dealing with racism and moving forward. Let me say first, uh, Kevin, it's uh, great to hear that you, you were with the young people who went out to Ferguson. I think that this, uh, the, the, just, just to comment, I, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, many things of of that of that pilgrimage that you were on, but it's so important um, to be present. And I think that this idea of going to uh, places where uh, this that that where we have seen uh, such um, overt examples of racism. It's, uh, and to be present in those places is just so, so important, and I'm so glad you had that opportunity uh, to, to, to get there. I think, in a, and one of the things I would say to all of that is we need to think about all the places that are like that, um, that there are places like that that haven't gotten in the newspapers or they've only gotten in very local, local stories, and it's important that Christians figure out ways of just being there, of showing up and being present. And I, I, I think in, I really believe uh, that, that that has uh, power uh, just in itself. I, what, what, you, what, the, what you know about fear is that uh, so much of what we have been talking about in this past hour derives from fear. There are other things that causes this, but fear is one of them. And if you know that this, it comes from fear, that the fear is unfounded, how do you get that in your mind that it affects the way that you move among the people that other people are afraid of? And how, and it is not easy because the people who are on the other end of being feared for no reason, right, have learned not to be very trustful of anyone who might have that attitude. And so you have to be present but be willing to live through the history that other people like you have created. And so, and, and there's nothing else to do but to do it. I mean, I don't know any other way <laughs> that this is going to be different until we start acting the difference that we want. I and so what you're, so. what you're, what, what, what you, what you are suggest, what, what you have done is absolutely right. Keep doing it. Find other places to make this pilgrimage and just work through the fear, right? and the distrust right, toward the communication. Do you see that we as the church have uh, an opportunity to uh, 
create an environment where that fear can be um, dissipated, dismantled? Yes, and I think we have to, and, and, and I think we've learned examples in dealing with other isms. I think we have we have learned how uh, to do that, that, how to proceed. That we're not always successful. I think, but, but I think we, that we have learned how to proceed in our uh, in in the struggle we have had about understanding that all gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual uh, people, queer people are children of God. And the first thing we did was we said they were children of God. And we did that years ago in a convention. It was, it was one of the interesting resolutions, to pass a resolution to say people are children of God. And we did that. And then we kept, we kept at it. We just kept at it. And, we, we, and it meant that we had to take decision, make decisions to be, to be clear about that, that we would have made about for those people if they had not been. And so if you elect someone who is gay, who you definitely would have elected if they weren't gay, and now everybody gets mad at you, you have to just say that, that they're children of God, and we're heading on. We're moving on. And we become an example. And that is just so important, and we have to make sure we're doing that um, in, around all people who are considered other. Because if we, if we are really understanding them as our brothers and sisters, children of God, all the people who live in the boundaries of that parish right, are as much our concern as the people who come to all of our services every Sunday. Right? If we understand that, right, then I think we have, we, we, it, it, will, it will have an effect both on ourselves and on, other, on the people who, we look, who look at us. Great. Right. So I think we're, Is it Paul who said? I think that's, right? that's perfect. perfect. We'll know them by the way they love each other. Great. So thank you. We're, we're down to two minutes, and I wanted to make sure that Karen had a, a couple of minutes to uh, wrap up. And uh, thank you so much um, for, for being here, Byron. And I'm going to turn it over to, to, to Karen. Well, thank you, everyone, for this evening. Um, I want to thank Byron in particular and my partner, James, and to remind us that our next web conference is on November 17th, where James will be the a presenter, and the topic will be, um, um, and also facilitate our questions and answers, and the topic will be, are you benefiting from the establishment? Um, James, did you want to say anything a little bit more about that, or is that good? Uh, well, sure. As, as we were talking here, the discussion really is about uh, white privilege and how people are benefiting it, benefiting from it, and not benefiting from it. As as Byron said, we need to understand um, how people are um, either benefiting or not benefiting from it. And uh, after that, thinking about what we can do to uh, to make things more fair make things more reasonable and, and follow the, the, the steps that uh, Jesus laid out for us. So that's what the discussion will be about next, next time we get together. Okay. Thank you. We look forward to it. Um, I, Byron, I again thank you for your very rich discussion, um, helping us think about break, listening to our history and not running from it or ignoring it, um, and thinking about how we are compelled by our baptismal covenant to end racism, not just to discuss it or think about it, but to actually act. And, you know, one of the questions is beyond where do we go beyond training and getting some tools together. And you talked about um, discussion with all people in the same room, um, looking at examples of disparity so that we can actually see the lay of the land um, and what is happening and how does that make sense in our context but also what is happening in terms of how are people um, interrupting, dismantling racism and how that might make sense for, for us in each of our contexts. And um, how are we individually, day by day, looking at how we're fulfilling our baptismal covenant and how we are uh, making room that all people, all members, 
may be parts of the family of God. And, you know, this whole idea of expanding our present boundaries, to rethink our boundaries, rethink what boundaries mean, to explode boundaries. And so I appreciate your comments um, with us today and the, present, the, um, the, the idea of witness and the presence of our participants that have been listening and writing their comments. So, Thank you all and thank you for having me. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.